Bat City is sponsored and supported by attorneys Alan Feldman and Jeff Wirtz. The law firm of Feldman and Wirtz LLP is celebrating its 15th year as Aspen's preeminent boutique law firm, providing litigation and transactional legal representation to residents of the Roaring Fork Valley and beyond. Good morning. My name is Bill Sterling, and I have the distinct pleasure this morning of, of being here with an old friend of mine uh, who I've known for almost 30 years. I think we actually met in one of the Fourth of July parades uh, many years ago. And Hugh Wise, who is the author of the book that we're going to be discussing today called The Little Lead Soldier, uh, as a graduate of Princeton University, where one of my best friends from high school also attended, whose first name happened to be Hugh as well, too. And Hugh has been a trial attorney uh, working in Aspen over the last 30 years, and his wife is long tied to many of the old families here in Woody Creek, and, and uh, I think she was glad to move back here. It was almost felt, probably felt like she was coming home. And he was a history major and uh, graduated with honors, and and then went on to law school at the University of Pennsylvania. And, uh, and, and in part of that time, or before he went to law school, he was uh, in the Peace Corps teaching down in Brazil and uh, taught at uh, a couple of quite storied universities in, 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 in Brazil and, uh, and served the country that way. Um, so he's written a lot in his life, in his work, writing briefs, uh, but this is a, a, a radical departure from the, the, the normal kind of writing that Hugh is used to doing. I want to thank this morning also uh, Grassroots for uh, hosting this and John Masters, the executive director of Grassroots, who, who's really a, a student of World War I, and that's what this book is really all about. Um, and uh, John Masters uh, has read this book and, and invited Hugh and and me to have a discussion about it here today. Um, it's, it's a unique tome. Um, it's, 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 it's a vivid, uh, very interesting book. It's published by Yardley Press, um, and, um, and it's available uh, uh, at Explore Booksellers, and it's uh, also available online. Um, but, you know, the great thing about this is, is that um, its design, formation, and presentation are, are different than anything I've ever read before in a book. And Hugh, I've read a lot of books in my life, if, having had the opportunity to introduce books uh, and lead discussions there for almost 25 or 30 years. So uh, Catherine Thalberg, my late wife, was the founder of, of Explore. But Hugh's family has a, just this great storied history. Um, um, uh, his his great-grandfather was a former governor of the state of Virginia. And uh, uh, his grandfather was, uh, was in the Congress. And, and, uh, and his grandfather, who was the soldier uh, in this particular book, um, had incredible connections with uh, people like Teddy Roosevelt and, and, and uh, people like that during that era. And um, so I think what we'd like to do is, um, is, uh, is, is begin with uh, what kind of a soldier was your grandfather? And, 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 and Hugh, tell us a little bit about the, in, in the estate of your family, you had a choice of some of the things that were available to you. And there was a, 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 a wrapped packet of handwritten letters. And, uh, and then there was a, a, a printed book with letters in them from the war. And I don't think that you, before that, had really known much about them. How did all this get going? Well, first of all, Bill, I want to thank you for interviewing me on this. It's a great opportunity, and I know you've interviewed a number of very celebrated people, and I'm not really in their company, but I appreciate you asking me to, to interview with you on this, and I thank John Masters for the opportunity of doing it also. But it's a unique book, Hugh. It, uh, I've, never, I've never been engaged with a book quite like this. 
Well, let me tell you what, how I got started on this is, and first of all, when I was, I came from a military family, basically. Uh, my grandfather was a graduate of West Point and served in the regular army, what they called the regular army as a career. He served in Cuba and in the Philippines. And my great-grandfather was a, a Confederate soldier and my great-great-grandfather was <clears throat> a Confederate Soldier was also a general, and so and my father served in the Second World War as a colonel. Uh, and frankly, I wasn't much interested in the military as I was growing up, and didn't have any family pressure to do that sort of career. So that's unique that they didn't put pressure on you about that, actually. Yeah, I, and I'm very thankful because it just really wasn't my orientation and this book which is here it's called the letters of the little lead soldier i uh, i was aware it was on my family's bookshelf but i really didn't look at it until i inherited it when uh, the last of my parents died and then i got really interested in it and my grandfather, who I call the Colonel, I never met him. Um, he was, he died in May of 1942, and I was born in July of 1942. And I always refer to him as the Colonel rather than as my grandfather because I kind of think that was the appellation that he actually preferred. I think he liked the fact that he was a Colonel in the United States Army and that he had, from a Confederate family, he had gone into the U.S. Army, basically the enemies of his father and grandfather during the Civil War. I'm sure that had all kinds of implications, my God. The late <laughs> unpleasantness, as those of us from the South used to call that conflagration. Well, I'm sure, and, and I was, I was a northerner, basically. Uh, my great-grandfather moved up to New York after the late uh, unpleasantness. And after that, that branch of the family stayed north. Well, there are a lot of the wises that uh, stayed south, but I was definitely a, a northerner. But then I started to read some of the letters that were in there and I realized a couple of things. One, that my grandfather had a wonderful power of description. And I, I, I was just kind of amazed. I'd like to read a couple of Before things. Before you start reading, tell us, tell us what your father told your grandfather and what your father gave to your grandfather before he went off to the Great War. Yeah, that was interesting. At, at the time, my father was six years old, and my grandfather was 46 years old in the regular army, what they called the regular army as compared with conscripts and people who were drafted. He was a career army officer, and he, he said, my father said to my grandfather, I'm giving you a little lead soldier. And I'm going to ask the little lead soldier to write to me, uh, and to me being my father, about what was happening in the war. And I, uh, I inherited also the little lead soldier himself, which is right here. Oh my God, that is the lead soldier that your father gave to your grandfather when your father was six. Your grandfather was 46 on the eve of going into the war. Yes, and, and this little lead soldier went over in the dispatch bag and traveled around in all of the major conflicts that my grandfather, the colonel, was engaged in during World War I. And in he, order came, to... he came back, he had, he had some injuries. 
a couple of broken legs. His head is um, the little lead soldier. The did, little lead soldier did his <laughs> his head comes off, <laughs> but he survived the war as did the colonel. And so your grandfather was faithful to the promise that uh, your father asked him to do, which was to ask the lead soldier to report back about what was happening to him. Absolutely, and he, he wrote these magnif magnificently descriptive letters. And they were from the lead soldier to your dad. Exactly. <laughs> All right. This, but, this is what is so very different and, uh, and so uh, refreshing in, in, about this book. And the thing that, that amazed me, I mean, his, history can be very dull. As a college student of history, I sometimes found myself very bored with descriptions of, of wars, of casualties, things of that nature, which were really very dull. Uh, you know, I survived it, got my degree, but there was an imagination in a lot of that. But the colonel was such an imaginative writer, it really put life into a lot of these letters that the lead soldier himself wrote. But, of course, <laughs> the lead soldier was That wasn't, was the metaphor. That was the metaphor. The, the lead soldier himself didn't have the hand ability to write. Exactly. <laughs> But well, any, all right, well, what, read, read, us, read us a passage or two here that, that you think is important. And just to remind everybody, uh, last year when this book was published in 2017 was the 100th anniversary of America entering World War I, though the troops didn't actually arrive in Europe until the spring, I think, of 2018. Um, yes, that, that's correct. And being the 100th anniversary of the American involvement uh, is interesting to celebrate that because it really hasn't been celebrated very much in the press or uh, just, it's been kind of under-noticed, whereas the Second World War was it's very much noticed. We, we, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that because I think that's a very important point uh, in terms of the scope of the war and, and how European-centered the war was. But go ahead. Okay. This, this is a, a description of a battle in the... What page Mus, are you reading from, Hugh? Mus, Mus Argonne Forest, at the, towards the very conclusion of the war. And this is on page 219. The spirit and courage of the men was, however, undiminished, and determination showed in their faces as they crouched in the shell holes awaiting the H hour while the earth rocked and reeled with the thunder of our preparation fire and the Bosch counter preparation. Bosch was a derogatory uh, slang term for the Germans. H hour arrived. Our accompanying barrage fell and crept forward and over with clenched teeth and set faces. The waves scrambled from the shell holes and they were off. The Bosch counter barrage dropped. His machine guns hissed. The rasping rattle of his infantry fire joined in the chorus. The dense woods were an inferno of shrieking, screaming, crashing shells. Big trees were uprooted and cut down and the air was full of their flying branches. The very atmosphere seemed hot from the rush of the projectiles, but through it all pressed those khaki lines, on, 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 leaving their trails of writhing and motionless forms, but unhesitating and dashing through the shower of grenades, they leaped with their gleaming bayonets upon the Bosch trenches, and on, 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 the successive waves leaped frog till the position was ours. Now, I, I read that and thought that was a pretty graphic description of this battle. But then I read further on about what happened after the battle. And let me read this also, because it shows 
how graphic and how terrible this war was. I entitled the last chapter, The Debacle. This was following that particular confrontation. When the officers assembled this afternoon, it was pitiful little gathering. There was no major, only four of the 17 captains, but a remnant of the former big bunch of lieutenants. Do you remember that we received 18 lieutenants in the replacement at Bois d'Ez on October 10? 15 of that 18 are casualties. One of the battalions is commanded by a captain who is the only captain left in it. Another is commanded by a first lieutenant. Another is commanded by a second lieutenant. Four of the companies are commanded by sergeants, having each lost its seven officers and one is commanded by a corporal, having lost all its officers and all its sergeants. All of the battalion adjutants, all of the battalion intelligent officers, and all of the scout officers were killed or wounded. Only three of the seven surgeons remain. Two of the three chaplains, chaplains are casualties also. The regimental staff now consists of two officers. Now, that, that to me was a horrible result of this battle that was so graphically described. And, and I got interested in why in the world did all this happen? And in doing the research, and I did a lot of historical research on this, I found out that the American troops had been assigned by the supreme commander who was a Frenchman named Ferdinand Foch uh, to the most difficult terrain that any of the other forces, the British and the French, were facing. And they were assigned this task with the most inexperienced of the men uh, that were available in the First World War. And I got fascinated about why in the world did that happen? And there were, there were great confrontations between the American general, Jack Pershing, they called him Black Jack, and Foch and the French and British uh, commanders. This is all about that amalgamation of the American troops to join in with, the, with primarily the French and British forces. Right, the, the French and British basically wanted the Americans to send over men that they would put into their ranks. In other words, replacement for all their horrible number of casualties. They wouldn't have a distinct kind of uh, persona. They would not have a separate army. Mm -hmm. And Woodrow Wilson, the president, instructed Pershing, and Pershing was totally in favor of this, to have a separate American army so that the Americans would reap the glory that would come from what they expected to be the victory and participate in the spoils after the victory was won. So Pershing and the French and British commanders were in constant battle about how these troops would be used. And the Meuse Argonne was one of the first areas where the American troops had their separate identities and went their own way. And according to the French, they did a terrible job. Now this is this was actually on French soil, uh, but in sort of northern northeast northeastern France, and uh, and the terrain was quite as you were describing hilly and difficult in terms of the battles. Yes, that, that's and exactly. And this battle particularly. Uh, that's true. And, and this battle particularly, it was heavily forested. The Germans were really well entrenched, and it was very difficult to get them out of their trenches. They'd been for four years, they'd been building these trenches and they were really solidified. And that made it very difficult for the Americans to get through these lines. And the French Prime Minister, Georges Clemenceau, was very upset. They called him the tiger because he was, had a sort of ferocious personality. Mm -hmm. He wanted Pershing to get fired. And after this battle started, it had to pause because the Americans weren't getting anywhere. The Americans had to regroup. And they did that, and then after a four-day pause, they... Pershing actually challenged 
General Foch, I think, during that four-day period. Yes, he did. And there were disagreements, but it's interesting. If you, if you read Foch's memoirs, he didn't think, he didn't report there was any great confrontation. If you read Pershing's, article, Pershing's memoirs, he was standing up to Foch and basically drawing lines that say, we will not do this unless we have a separate American. Foch doesn't mention it at all, which, again, as a historian, makes me think, you know, the tale really belongs to the teller, and it's up to the reader to judge, if they can, what is right. Well, you know, what's, what's so great about this book, beyond the, the intimacy and the personal aspects of this and the whole thing of your family and its engagement with this, is um, it, it's, it's, it's an American point of view about World War I, these letters that came back to your mother, uh, to, to your father. And, um, and, and interestingly enough, there, Americans, the, the American voice about World War I has been minimal. Most of the accounts have come from European writers and writer, other, other writers. And so that's another thing that I think is so special about this book is getting that American point of view. I mean, we're, we, we ended up being in the war, literally in, in engaged in the barely six or seven months. That was all the, in the whole four years of the war. That, that's true, and there were 52,000 American killed in that war in that very short period of time. Good Lord. And, but another thing, going back to the American point of view, it's very interesting because I inherited letters from my grandmother to the colonel and the colonel back to my grandmother. And she shows what the ordeal was for a wife left in the United States in, around New York with three young boys. They had no place to live. There were no accommodations made by the Army for, for them to have housing. She lived in that short period of time in 12 different places. Oh my goodness. Going from relatives. At some point she, she lived in hotel rooms. Um, it was a pretty horrible description. She also gets into things such as there was concern that there'd be a submarine attack on New York City and all the lights on Broadway were told to be put out. Now, it, it really, the way it was described by the newspapers, they were afraid of an aerial attack. When you think about it, how could you have an aerial attack from submarines? It does, doesn't make any sense. Well, and no planes had flown across the Atlantic Ocean at that point, I don't think, either before, so, you know. But nonetheless, there was this hysteria that my grandmother was living through. And we also found, again, a, the personal story that they the were soldiering tells. at home while their husbands were soldiering in Europe. Absolutely. And my grandfather had his own personal problems. He was suffering from lameness, which how he disguised. So far, how had he gotten so far into the military if he had this bum leg? Interesting. I don't know. And I don't know how he got the bum leg to start off with. You know, but, you don't describe that in the book, but you talk about the bum leg and how it it, 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 they question his command even at one point when they actually realize that he has an injury. Yeah, and... But the, not from the war, but from before. From before the war. Yeah. And this is what gets into the personal story of the colonel, his wife, uh, the three boys, and makes it more than just a, a dull statistical, statistic-oriented history book. That's what's so special about it. I mean, the lead soldier is, you know, he's, he's like an intermediary. And, and in one book review that Mark Billingsley from Explorer said, he said he was even, he, the soldier was like a correspondent and he was able to share the, the colonel's feelings, you know, and emotions in a way that the colonel might never have written about him had he not had this vehicle of the lead soldier. Yeah, and that, that is so true. And it has, a lot of the colonel's real personal thoughts were expressed in these letters um, to Ida, my grandmother. Mm -hmm. 
in, in which he, he opens up even more than the little soldier does. But the little soldier does comment and make comments on, I think the colonel must have been thinking this, when obviously that's what the colonel was thinking, but he didn't want to say so. It was a wonderful medium for him to be able to do that. Hugh, we only have a, a couple of minutes left now. Um, what was so interesting, the Standing Army of America in 1917, 1918 had to be fewer than 100,000 troops. That's true. How they, many, probably, and then, and then eventually, I think, as many as a million American troops ended up being in the conflict in that last six months of the war. It was amazing, and really the Americans won the war for the Allies because there were so many of them. They may have been ill-prepared, Ill hurriedly sent over, but they made the difference in the war. And one other thing I ought to comment on, Bill, before we run out of time is, at, all, at the time all this was going forward, there was this horrible pandemic that was killing people, this flu. <sighs> It was, it was a worldwide academic in, in 1918. It was unbelievable. Yeah, and the people were coming over on the ships, and they were, the soldiers were coming over the ships and dying on the ships because of this influenza, which made it all the much, all much more difficult for them. Hugh, we've only got two minutes left to go, um, and we could go on and on with this. What would you say is the single thing that changed uh, the Pacific attitude of, of President uh, Woodrow Wilson to enter the war. Well, it was a real odd event called the Zimmerman Telegram, where basically the Germans were inviting the Mexicans to take back the where we're sitting right here, all of the southwest of the United States, uh -huh. were, and the Japanese to take over the Panama Canal. That got publicized, and it was an immediate outcry from the press, and that really was the final straw that caused the United States to get involved in this war. This book, everybody, is it's, it's just crisp, it's clear, and it's descriptive. Hugh is a very talented writer, and he did incredible research, not just research on Google and Wikipedia, way beyond that. And you had a damn good editor, I think, and, um, and I think we're very lucky to have Hugh in our community who's already working on another book. Do you want to briefly tell us what the, what the topic of that next book is? Well, it's, it's going to be about uh, the press reports in the Spanish-American War, which were totally false, which really launched Theodore Roosevelt onto his political career. And, and Hugh's grandfather was a friend of President Roosevelt, and, uh, and he was in the Spanish-American War as well, too. Hugh, thank you so much for taking the time to share this with us, and thanks to Grassroots for the programs that they do all the time. That City is sponsored and supported by attorneys Alan Feldman and Jeff Wirtz. The law firm of Feldman and Wirtz LLP is celebrating its 15th year as Aspen's preeminent boutique law firm, providing litigation and transactional legal representation to residents of the Roaring Fork Valley and beyond.